I'd like to speak to you today on the subject of uh, taking class notes, some hints at least on taking class notes. First of all, let me begin by saying that the key to doing well in any class that I teach, and this is probably true of other classes as well, is to have a good set of class notes. But this is going to require um, some unlearning on the part of at least of some people. This is not 13th and 14th grade. Therefore, there may be some unlearning that becomes necessary in making the transition from K through 12 education to higher education. A good K through 12 preparation might uh, conceivably include some good note taking skills, but I would say as an empirical generalization based on at least my experience as a teacher over a number of years, uh, American K-12 typically does not prepare its graduates for good note taking. In addition, if you are one of those people, uh, K through 12 is very probably giving you some very bad general ideas about what education is or should be. Um, what we could call the doxa, uh, which is really a, a set of tacit uh, but general ideas that you find in K-12 is in key ways different from the corresponding set of ideas in higher education. Uh, a note on the terminology doxa is, is a word that goes back to the Greeks. Uh, Plato uses it. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith talks about more or less the same thing under what he calls the conventional wisdom, a set of ideas which uh, may be doubtful, but uh, at least in which most people place their credence. Pierre Bourdieu, the sociologist, uses doxa in a, in a little more precise way uh, by specifying that normally the ideas that fall under any particular doxa or another, and there will be different ones as, as we see here, uh, tend to be tacit, tend to be taken for granted. It seems to me that Bourdieu's uh, way of, of, of sketching this, whether this is his sketch, it's rather like um, what is called the uh, Halland spheres. Uh, Halland spheres are meant to address the ways in which ideas change. And there are, are three spheres, the outer sphere, uh, this is not quite uh, Dante's, uh, Three ring, uh, Dante's rings of, of hell, but um, the sphere of deviance uh, and ideas can pass from that into the sphere of legitimate controversy and sometimes even from there in turn into the sphere of uh, consensus. Um, so this Helen sphere notion is a good way of talking about the way in which ideas change. And just as the border between deviance and legitimate controversy in, in the Helen spheres is permeable, it seems to me that that between doxa and opinion, that is between the tacit dimension, as, as Michael Polanyi would have called it, and, uh, and that but which were explicit, might also be permeable. Uh, it should be possible, even if uh, assumptions are assumed tacitly to surface them, uh, to examine them, uh, to criticize them. So when I talk about the doxa of public education that needs to be unlearned in higher education, here's what I mean. K-12 presumes, it seems to me, at least four things. All students want to learn always. Education equals the transfer of information or content. Education equals whatever tests measure. And teachers equal information or content providers. Uh, one of the currently popular conclusions from this is that if test scores are down, then K through 12 teachers are failing because they are not correctly transferring content to all the eager, willing receptacles. We hear this uh, often. Now, of these uh, assumptions, uh, we can ask, are they true or false? I want to suggest that they're mostly false. Higher education may build on K through 12 experience, but it also involves making a serious rupture. Certain bad habits need to be unlearned. The corresponding assumptions, it seems to me, for higher education would be the following. Students select themselves. Uh, students are here not because a law says they have to be there, uh, but because they're there from self-interest. Secondly, education is a process of actively wrestling with intellectual challenges, not passive information transfer. Thirdly, tests are at best imperfect, I think pretty much all teachers know this, and teachers are facilitators. Between these two sets of expectations, uh, the, the doxa of K-12, the doxa of higher education, uh, there is, uh, uh, we might say, a great gulf fixed. Now, is it possible to form some general ideas, to have some general expectations about how to conduct uh, learning in, in higher ed, when we're faced with a situation as we are in which one size does not fit all, 
because that's one of the transitions that one makes from K-12 to higher ed. In higher ed, there's greater autonomy. In higher ed, there's greater responsibility. Hmm? In college, expect that different instructors will do things differently. So, you know, Professor X did it this way last semester. Doesn't mean Professor Y is going to do it the same way. One size does not fit all. So Professor A gives a study guide, Professor B does not. It's perfectly legitimate. One of the nice things about teaching in higher ed as opposed to K through 12 is that there is this leeway for, for variance. Professor C gives extra credit, Professor D does not. Professor E counts attendance as part of the grade, Professor F does not. Professor G gives many tests, Professor H gives few tests. Professor I gives you his lecture notes, Professor J does not. So standardized uniform expectations are going to hold much less uh, in higher ed than they may have in K through 12. Therefore, it seems to me that there's unlikely to be any sort of magic bullet, any sort of you know, single one correct pathway to learning how to take notes in college courses. That is not to say though that there may not be some hints and some general principles, however, and I would uh, during the course of this talk like to offer you a few of those hints. But in any case, in college, expect that different instructors will do things differently. Hmm? So when Professor X lectures at Penn, she makes explicit a highly structured format, outline style. But when Professor Y lectures at Oxford, uh, he reads uh, loosely from the manuscript he's writing currently. So those are two kind of extremes. I myself tend to fall in the middle. Um, I give lectures accompanied by PowerPoints with some hints. So a little bit of structure, not totally unstructured, not rigidly structured. I don't mind imposing a little bit of structure, like uh, you know, putting a slide in my PowerPoint saying, hey, you know, be sure you have this in your notes. Here's a major point. I don't mind reviewing. You know, what did we talk about the last class? We talked about metaphysics, ethics, and epistemology. Um, but I can't, and frankly, I don't want to just swap out a five-minute list of information and sound bites in place of an hour or two of lecture time. So, in my class at least, uh, getting a good structured set of class notes is your job, not mine. Different instructors will vary in the degree to which they spell out an outline for you, get used to the difference. Um, in any event, there's a larger point here. Regardless of differences between one professor and another, as you go through, through formal schooling in search of an education, and I, I hope you do understand that there is a, a distinction to be drawn between schooling and education, hopefully schooling will facilitate your education, but they're really two different processes. As you go through and get your education, do work in becoming less reliant on the prof and more reliant on yourself. Teachers, some have compared Jesus and Socrates. They were, they, there were some points of comparison. They're both culture heroes. They were both uh, sentenced to death. They had followers who thought this was wrongful in both cases and, and wanted their reputation to hold up. But there's another key difference that a number of people have noted between uh, Jesus and Socrates. If Jesus is your teacher, the more Jesus you get, the more Jesus you need. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But Socrates fades out. The more Socrates you get, the less Socrates you need, the more you become your own Socrates. So to the extent that Socrates becomes influential to that same extent, Socrates fades out. So I would uh, paraphrase Emerson's advice, uh, every man his own Jesus. He might as well have said every man his own Socrates. So first hint, actively impose an outline on your class notes. So the key word here is actively. Taking good lecture notes is like writing an essay. You may or may not start from a clear outline. I know they tried to teach me this in, in, in 11th grade and uh, I never, never, never could start with an outline. But I always found that, you know, after I started to write something, I could look at it and kind of tease out, extract out an outline and maybe firm it up a little bit. And I think pretty much anybody can do this, whether or not they're good at writing. Uh, from an outline or not, as, as I myself am not. Um, so there are two stages here. Stage one, during class you take notes. And even now you're listening actively to see if there are major points being made. You know, one of the key, uh, the key skills you need to develop, and it's, it's, it's something you learn as you go along, nobody's born with this, <clears throat> um, is to sort out the forest from the trees. You know, what's the forest? What's the major point? What are the trees? What are the details? In any case, uh, note taking is not just stenography or transcription. It's not just recording verbatim every detail. There's a difference between a note taker and a court reporter, okay? Uh, you as note takers in higher ed are not court reporters. And cell phone stenography isn't any better. In my class, uh, after I finish a lecture, I give uh, 
the, my slides in, in PDF format to my students. So they will have the slides to refer to in their notes, but I notice a number of people in class will pull out their cell phones. Okay, that's fine, but you know, you've still got to process that information in real time. Note taking, as I said before, is not transcription. Um, look at this cartoon, two students sitting side by side. One's taking notes, one is not. You're not taking notes, says the one. Well, I record the lecture and then use voice recognition software on my computer to transcribe when I get home. That way I'm free to take in the lecture without note taking to distract me. That doesn't mean there's not other things that are going to distract him. Um, a big thing this guy is missing uh, is if you write something down yourself, now you own that idea. Hmm? And another mistake he makes is thinking that understanding the lecture is passively taking it in. Well, how about this note taker way in the back in the purple and uh, lavender? Is that a good idea? Probably not. Um, the pen or pencil is mightier than the keyboard. This is the title of a research paper uh, by Pam Miller and uh, her colleague Oppenheimer. Uh, I don't like to read slides to you, but it's worth just reading this one in detail. Taking notes on laptops rather than in longhand is increasingly common. Many researchers have suggested that laptop note-taking is less effective than longhand note-taking for learning. Prior studies have primarily focused on students' capacity for multitasking and distraction when using laptops. The, the present research suggests that even when laptops are used solely to take notes, they may still be impairing learning because their use results in shallower processing. In three studies, we found that students who took notes on laptops performed worse on conceptual questions than students who took notes longhand. We show that whereas taking more notes could be beneficial, laptop note takers tendency to, to transcribe lectures verbatim rather than processing information and reframing it in their own words is detrimental to learning. Let me repeat that last line. Laptop note takers tendency to transcribe uh, lectures verbatim rather than processing information and reframing it in their own words is detrimental to learning. You know, think about a stenographer, a court reporter, they don't need to think about what they're transcribing. They just need to be accurate in what they're putting down. Rapid typing promotes shallowness. Um, Miller elaborates that since almost no one can transcribe verbatim by longhand, if you're doing it by longhand, this forces you to understand, to think, and to process. An active listener reframes the lecture as their own, and this paradoxically is perhaps easier to do with a more primitive technology than with uh, digital technology. The point is, when you listen to a lecture, you're not just a passive receptor. You are attending and you are grasping. So what you want to do is own that lecture. Listen actively, reframe in your own words. This helps you own what you're hearing. Now, within reason, if things are not clear during the lecture itself stage, when is the time to ask questions? Uh, the aim, again, is to produce a structured set of notes, not just a laundry list of facts, not just a transcript of what someone else is saying. It's a matter, again, of active listening, which is, again, a skill which, with which no one is born. It's a work in progress. It always will be. And nothing but practice makes perfect. Here's the suggestion. Can anybody read that? I think we all can. Um, this is interesting implications for reading theory. But basically, if you use abbreviations, um, that can help um, and be creative. I used to, I, Greek was my undergraduate language, so I would use Greek letters when I was talking about philosophy. I just put the letter phi, psychology, uh, put psi. Uh, and I knew what that was. That's really, uh, nobody else is going to be reading my notes. I just need to know. Um, here's something I teach my students on day one, and I think it's really useful. Uh, and I wish that somebody had taught me this when I was a student. Uh, I learned this only much later when I was a teacher. One of my colleagues uh, taught, told this to a class we jointly taught, and I was just I was amazed. It was a good idea. It's called the Harvard Law School Note-Taking Method. And if you go to Harvard Law School, uh, first thing you learn day one is this. Um, take your notepad out, draw a line down the middle. Go to page two, draw a line down the middle. You know where this is going. And what you do thereafter is you take notes on only half of your paper, you leave the other half blank. Why? Well, a um, number of reasons. Um, one of them is that sometimes uh, 
professors talk too quickly. Hey, who would that be? Um, and you might miss something that one of your colleagues uh, gets. So you can compare notes and you can fill in some things in your notes that you missed and they can do the same thing. In my class, because I do take my PowerPoints in, and, and put them into PDF format and, and email them as handouts, uh, it's possible to go through a set of notes and then embellish those notes, you know, based on a review of the PowerPoint slides. Uh, maybe if you're studying for a test, um, uh, you know, you can quiz yourself. There are lots of different things you can do. So, you know, if you do this, I tell my students, um, our, our, our college uh, photo animal is a cougar. Uh, you get a Harvard education and you only pay a cougar tuition. How good is that? But in any case, I assume that, you know, when you take notes, you're going to review them. So here's stage two, review your notes. This is where you go to embellish. This is where comparing notes with others or using PowerPoint handouts, if, if your instructor does that as well, can help. Uh, it's also where you can add outline structure. Mm -hmm. So at least once a week for every course, I think, not just mine, you should sit down with your notes and say to yourself, okay, what the hell did that idiot say all this week in philosophy class? Oh yeah, right. Uh, talked about the two different senses of philosophy, talked about metaphysics, ethics, and epistemology. Right. Got it. Good put some outline structure on there, you know, and you know, there we go. At stage two, uh, Einstein has some very good advice. You don't really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. Hmm? Make things as simple as possible, just no simpler, uh, as, as he also said. Um, now, you don't have to actually uh, bore granny, but, you know, you can sort of talk to granny or someone in your head. Um, make the lecture your own, see if you can summarize it. And then if you do that psychologically, you will own that lecture. It's now assimilated, it's now yours. Stage two, of course, is going to work best if in stage one, uh, you've already begun to wrestle with some structure. Here's another suggestion. I don't particularly use this myself, but you know, you might want to. Um, Rewrite your notes uh, and have two notebooks. Take one to class and then uh, when you go home to study and, and reread your notes, transcribe them perhaps more neatly and embellish them in a second notebook. That's just kind of a variation of the Harvard method uh, if, that f if that seems useful to you. There's also the Cornell method. It's another way of dividing paper up lots of different methods. But here's the thing, whichever method you use, you do need a stage two. You do need to first actively listen during the course of the lecture, then you need to sit down at some point subsequently and review and embellish. Hmm? Periodically, say weekly, uh, set these things into context. And this, again, certainly goes for my course of lectures, but again, I suspect it's, uh, it's general, good general advice for any course, other course as well. Here's another hint. Education is not merely a matter of content and information. Getting an education is not about cramming a brain with content, funneling it in. It's knowledge is not just a sack of information. And once again, this may involve some unlearning from K-12 in which the contrary assumption seems to be in place. It may be helpful to tape class lectures, but an audio recording, uh, likewise a transcription verbatim of a recording, not the same thing as a set of notes. Notes are condensation, real-time notes summarized. You know, if you go to the Sistine Chapel, you will see what everybody has seen. Sistine Chapel is, is full of artwork. It's very busy. And you'll see people with video cameras walking around for hours at a time, you know, videotaping all these paintings on the ceiling and on the walls, etc. Now, what are they going to do with this videotape? I mean, are they going to watch this in real time when they get home? Are they going to bore their friends with not, not just vacation slides, but vacation videos? No. Um, a, a, one needs not just a live uh, account, but, but a condensation a summary to make sense of anything. Well, now, you know, wouldn't it just be great if you could upload all the information in your textbook into your brain while you slept? Or how about we could take in some information in the form of a pill or a liquid? And you know, I'm going to knock back uh, tonight a couple of pints of coursework. Acquiring knowledge does not work this way. Um, cramming, uploading, taking in would all be passive methods of filling up with content. And getting an education, on the contrary, is an active process. One has to engage personally and actively with lectures and readings. One has to process actively the concepts one encounters and struggle actively to put them in some structure. This goes to a very fundamental point, very fundamental point about human cognition. Um, the human brain is not just a sponge. It is not just uh, John Locke's blank slate. Kant, on the other hand, was correct. Uh, the mind attends, the mind grasps. 
it, there's a difference between having your eyes open and actually seeing. Seeing involves noticing, not just having your eyes open. As hearing involves listening, not just having your ears unplugged. So teaching isn't simple content transfer. It's not a matter of you know the professor conveying the material to the sponge head student and off we go. Again, getting to be an active wrestler with difficult concepts may mean unlearning the model of passive receptacle from K-12. Getting an education is not just cramming. Knowledge is not just a sack of information. This is a common confusion. Uh, many people seem to suppose that information or data is the same thing as knowledge. You hear a lot of nonsense talk these days about data-driven this, that, and the other. But they're not the same things. Um, on the contrary, knowledge is not simple information. Knowledge is always structured information. Simple information without a structure would be quite useless. I mean, uh, digital information, uh, we call it digital because it could be expressed in digits one through zero, which has an interesting history in, in the fact that the, the original uh, digital computers were at on off switches represented by one for on, zero for off. Um, but uh, basically you can encode uh, any bit of information in digital binary form, uh, ones and zeros. That's not knowledge. That's pure information, but it's the furthest thing from knowledge. Here we have an example, not ones and zeros, but here we have an example of information. Um, somebody might write down a bunch of facts about, uh, for example, rationalism and empiricism, the main philosophers uh, involved in that, uh, and so on and so forth. And all this is just true enough as it goes, but uh, this doesn't amount, this collection of information doesn't amount to any real knowledge. If you take that information and put it in a structured form like an essay, now we're getting reverging onto, onto knowledge uh, because we're giving it structure. One good index of having acquired general knowledge in a course would be the ability to produce an essay like this, giving information, a literate context and a structure rather than just heaping it together uh, with, a, with a bunch of, you know, a, a bunch of scribble. Note taking is not just transcription, knowledge is not just information. Therefore, if you find yourself asking any of the following questions, um, how much of this material do I have to memorize? Or can't you just tell me which facts are the important ones? Yeah, but how much of this is gonna be on the test? Then you're probably not asking the right question. Uh, and here, by the way, is um, how not to email your professor. Um, I am in your class this semester would have missed the first four days due to do DO2, some unexpected problems with work and family. <laughs> Grin. I would like to, letter number two, make up the work if you, you, letter you, could send me the syllabus and all the handouts. Thank you. And also if I missed any important info, will we be needing the book this semester because I'm on a budget, LOL. Um, now I have to warn you, no students were harmed in the making of this slide, but but it's a hypothetical slide that's all too real. It betrays uh, the kinds of problems uh, to which I'm alluding uh, in today's talk. Here's a third hint. Education is about method as well as about content. Christopher Hitchens hits the nail on the head when he says the following. Further to the principles of free inquiry uh, and open debate that goes up to make a great university, my view is and will always be that it matters not what you think. Anyone can have thoughts. Many people content themselves with feelings. Uh, it matters uh, how you think. Uh, it matters not what you think. It matters how you think. Method is about how. Content is about what. A liberal education, and this is what we're trying to get at in higher education, is about learning methods by which to wrestle uh, and thus to cope with complexity at first hand. And thus, over and above, simply mastering the uh, disciplinary content of, of various academic disciplines, astronomy, history, anthropology, all the rest, it's important to cultivate higher level skills in confronting information and evaluating information and placing information in context. <clears throat> A friend of mine <coughs> served in World War II at a post uh, commanded by this officer, Colonel Bernard Lentz, and Lentz could see as the war was winding down that um, these young people under his command would soon be going on and, and many of them going on to higher education. And it was in fact true of the GI Bill um, gave them a, a lot of these guys an opportunity to do that. It's a very major change in, in American education, indeed in American social history. <laughs> and uh, Lentz said to them, uh, and my, my friend remembered this uh, lifelong, you will go to college to learn many things you will not use in later life by methods you will use for the rest of your lives. And I think he too hit the nail on the head there. 
Part of this involves learning to cope with primary texts, whether this be a major novel or a poem, a primary source document in history, the work of a major intellectual figure in philosophy, or whatever it may be. Another part of this involves uh, how to follow a course of lectures on a subject to pull together its general features and to place it in an overall structure of knowledge. You know, I tell my students there, if you sit in my lectures, I'm trying to tell you a story. There is a coherent point here. There's a narrative, there's a thread. And, you know, it's important to listen for, for that particular part of the forest uh, amidst all the other trees. Now, I don't want to make it sound too easy. I do expect such things to be difficult. And if you are experiencing difficulty with your academic coursework, including note taking, this may not necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, it may just be a sign that you are paying attention. You know? He who knows but does not know that he knows thinks he does not know. He who does not know but does not know that he does not know thinks he knows. And uh, recall Einstein's uh, advice. Uh, do not worry about your difficulties in mathematics. I can assure you that mine are greater still, even as he said, everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. However, beware shortcuts, beware Einstein for dummies, uh, beware thinking that uh, note taking is just a fairly simple cut and dried matter. And this brings me to my fourth and last hint, which is don't study for the test. What? Yes, don't study for the test. Study for yourself. Study for the sake of education, your education. Once again, um, this may involve some unlearning from K through 12, because in K through 12, education is defined explicitly as whatever tests measure. Where could such an idea have ever originated? Well, it seems to me there are multiple sources. It's, it's a very wrong-headed idea, but, but it certainly comes at us in lots of ways. Uh, one of these sources is the bureaucratic organization, administration of large public schools. Uh, another is certain uh, political agendas. And a third is the influence of behaviorist psychology on the overall psychology of education. Test scores are a shortcut to managing a large labor force. So if you're a superintendent of public schools and you've got thousands of teachers and thousands of students, it's just easier to cut to a number. Um, and, and, and to confuse numbers with data and confuse data with information, information with knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Einstein, Einstein, Einstein was a smart boy. Um, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Another source uh, is political agendas, and this is not a partisan issue. Uh, administrations from the Democrats to the Republicans uh, tend to uh, confuse training with education, tend to think that it, as long as everyone learns uh, computer skills, then we're okay. There's also uh, another noise fact of the billionaire boys club, you know, folks like Bill Gates and Eli Broad and so forth think because they have money, they therefore know uh, what education is and they, uh, they elbow their way in. And the last influence, uh, behaviorist psychology, I mentioned John Locke uh, a little earlier um, and his blank slate is tabula rasa. Um, Locke may have con con compared the human mind to an increasingly blank slate. B.S. Skinner came along and said the slate is completely unreasonable. All we have are observables, uh, input to a black box and behavioral output to a black box, the black box being the human mind. Um, we want to be scientific, capital S, says B.S. Skinner, and so we have to do away with these non-observables and so on and so forth, which means that um, Skinner basically, and, and, and the, the influence of his behavior psychology is deliberately shallow. Uh, it poo-poo's uh, what's commonly called depth psychology of Freud's, for example, Freud's model of the mind. Um, and the educational psychology that this generates then, Skinner's uh, behaviorism, is accordingly shallow also. Uh, behaviorism can't define learning in any terms which involve reference to cognitive processes. Those are just locked in that black box, which is ineffable, unknowable, impenetrable. Behaviorism opts instead for uh, an overall view of science, uh, which, which operates with operational definitions. You can only define a term if you can specify an observable operation, uh, which, uh, which indicates that term. So for example, if you wanted to study intelligence, um, you could take test scores. Uh, SAT test scores show that you're intelligent. Uh, age, well, who knows? It's not observable, but you could take people's self-reports. Um, 
if you wanted to measure another kind of intelligence, let's say you wanted to say to see who are the best uh, auto mechanics, uh, time them on, on repairing an engine, the quicker ones are more intelligent, etc. Um, some people operate with the uh, operational definition of clean dishes, uh, any dish which comes out of a dishwasher um, and uh, goes into the, into the cabinet and storage, but they're not always, of course, clean. The simplest standard operational definition of learning is improved performance as measured by test taking behavior. This is very simple minded, but again, it does appeal to bureaucrats. And the combined result of this is the perfect storm uh, in which test scores are taken as a proxy measure for education. Uh, this uh, affects, inflicts, uh, is inflicted on and infects, infects and evicts uh, K through 12. Um, so once again, uh, this may involve some unlearning from K-12. Uh, however, mm. here's one way in which thinking about tests may be helpful to studying. Hmm? Remember Emerson's uh, modified advice, every man his own Socrates. When you begin to study for a test, do the same thing you'd be doing in, this, in stage two of note taking. Ask yourself, what are the fundamental questions here? Ask yourself, if I were the teacher making up a test of this subject, what sorts of things would I ask? What would I expect a student in this class, at this point in this class, to be able to explain or respond to? And chances are that the topics that you would choose taking the sort of broad view may well correspond to the same topics that your instructor would choose for the very same reasons. In other words, this is Einstein's advice all over again. Make yourself the lecturer, you know, own the lecture and, uh, and, and you'll be much better off. Now, I have to say, this strategy will not always be foolproof. Um, we cannot rule out 100% the possibility that there may be sadistic professors. <laughs> and then I said, <laughs> the tests will look just like what we've covered in the lecture. <laughs> I have to say, there are some people, not many, I hope. Uh, but the further the ratio gets away from 100%, the better my advice about being around Socrates will be. In my case, I, again, have a very... Um, very cherry view of tests. Tests should show what you know, what you not what you don't know. Uh, questions should not be gratuitously tricky. I try not to ask questions out of left field. I try to ask questions about central concepts. Chances are, if a concept got repeated in the lecture, it's going to be important. Chances are, if I start the class off by reviewing and discuss concepts from last session, those concepts are probably important. And um, I've come around to the view that a well-designed study guide can be a good thing if it's properly organized. So in any case, I hope this has been useful um, to you. Uh, again, there's no magic bullet because instructors will differ, um, styles of lecture will differ, and so strategies for taking notes will have to differ. But I think in summary, uh, the, the following four points uh, may be of general use. First of all, actively impose an outline on your notes. Secondly, education is not merely a matter of content information, so bear that in mind. Education is about method as well as about content, and uh, last, don't study for the test. Uh, this has been a talk on hints about taking class notes. Uh, my name is Michael Cavanaugh. Good day. <laughs>